afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the regularly scheduled Homelessness and Poverty uh, Committee. Uh, we have quorum, and I am joined by Marquise Harris Dawson and David Rue, and we will soon be joined uh, by uh, Monica Rodriguez. What I'd like to do, uh, colleagues, is take multiple item comment cards first before we get into uh, the hearing. And we're going to start with Armando Herman, who has filled out a comment cards for general public comment and all items. Armando Herman. So two minutes for all the items and one minute for general. That makes three minutes total. Forty-two USC nineteen eighty-three. The conflict with existing state and local laws and regulations are fuck you, bitches. I am the HHH committee here now from this point in time. Fuck you. In addition to item number two in CD10 and, oh, fat mommy's in the house. Quality Act of CEQA, the analyst who states for Herman Jason Wesson, the anti-Semitic racist, is that city CEQA guidelines under Article 3, Section 1, Class, no class, N, Herman Wesson, nigga, because you set forth by Sidio O'Farrell not to create a bridge of housing, but not to facilitate homeless people, bro. The tie don't fit, bro, the same way that tope on your head don't fit. Then on item four, Mr. Rue the Rapist, back in his college days, I'm bringing up Los Feliz because in Griffith Park, to determine 42 U.S.C. 12101 of discrimination. Why is it that we gay people don't have rights as equal as the non-segregated gays under the LGBTQ queer? You see, I like to engage in my queer activity like you, Mr. Dawson, and scratch my middle finger on my face and say, fuck you, 42 U.S.C. 1983, but I abide by the Brown Act. Not the brown act where you stick that brown thing up your ass. You have one minute for general public comment. So ladies and gentlemen, public Angelinos, you heard the testimony of my free speech. You see how I deliberately engage in my civil rights? Do you have the power? Do any of you in here have the power to talk about Measure HHH and Measure S? All these broken promises by local government to take you out of your communities, force you out of affordable rent, and you have nothing better to say but to be nice to this fucking fool, this bitch, this fucking faggot, and that fucking rapist root. I'll tell you something. Man up and get testicles and start the civil disobedience that we demand to be heard under the Brown Act. And yes, we have a right to criticize fucking crybaby elected officials like this bitch who's chairing this committee and his fucking friend, Transportation Bonin. All right, our next uh, speaker, multiple family items, uh, multiple family, multiple items. Uh, this is hardly a family environment in here. Multiple items. We have, uh, all right, we got to keep it quiet. We have uh, Jed Perriott, multiple items, and then uh, one minute for general public comment, three minutes total. Good afternoon, Council Members. Uh, Jed Perry with the Democratic Socialists of America, Los Angeles. I'm also here on behalf of the End Homelessness Now Coalition. Um, it is clear you all know permanent housing is the only solution to this crisis. Um, I think that looking at uh, vacant buildings, seeing them with our eyes that are owned by the city vacant lots uh, that continue to sit there while this crisis continues, um, you really need to start thinking beyond Triple H, which the time is long gone for that. Um, we're not seeing results, and we're going to need way more than 10,000 units over 10 years, right? We're going to need we're going to need over 60,000 units, according to the numbers right now, probably more than that, um, and we need them now. And the urgency is just not there. 
What we're seeing on the streets instead are efforts to erase the homeless, to criminalize, to banish them, um, using the bridge, the bridge shelters uh, to do that, uh, to harass folks, um, obviously to placate property owners and business owners who want to see police because they think that the shelters are going to attract more people. Uh, this is just not true. Um, even the police officers think it's a waste of money. I've talked to many of them about that. Um, police officers across the city do not like that they are there. Uh, during encampment cleanups. Um, unfortunately, they are forced to play social worker. Uh, just yesterday, Councilmember O'Farrell uh, at Alvarado, it was very infuriating to see Senior Lead Officer Solario um, get on his knees and, and try and tell the woman that she had to move for sanitation. A woman who was going through a mental health crisis, and he kept saying, sweetheart, please, I really don't want to put you in handcuffs right now. And I'm looking around and seeing 12 sanitation workers sitting there and Solario and his, uh, and his other officer, and I'm going, where is the mental health worker in this situation? Where are the social workers? Where are the trash cans? Where are very basic public health resources that we could be providing to folks who have nowhere to go? Who have nowhere to go, no matter how many bridge shelters are going to open this year? The encampments are going to remain. And criminalization is not the answer. I'm r really uh, also, I have to call out uh, Marquis Harris Dawson. Um, and more recently, Mark Ridley Thomas uh, have often said, we don't criminalize the homeless, we don't incarcerate the homeless. Anyone on the ground knows that's absolutely not true. That the opposite is in fact true. And, and maybe you define criminalization as someone being locked up for X amount of years. Um, you don't understand that the very act of uh, police officers filing an FI card on someone surrounding them is an act of harassment and criminalization as I witnessed uh, last week in Mitchell Farrell's district. Uh, the horse police uh, two of them uh, jumping onto the sidewalk next to an unhoused man sleeping who was not blocking the sidewalk, um, asking what his name is, who he, you know, do you have a record? For what reason is that but, but harassment to get him out of the area? Um, it's very infuriating. And, and again, one more, uh, as by my time is running out, uh, the, the item uh, regards to Triple H being used to refurbish currently existing housing, um, that money should go to brick and mortar only. And you cannot use Triple H to refurbish currently existing Thank units. You. It's brick and mortar money. Kendrick Rusted all items and two minutes for all items and one minute for general public comment. Good afternoon. Boy, LA, I, I come from San Francisco. I've lived in LA for seven years and I chose Broadway in the historic core because I'm an interior ar architect and I love the architecture. And it had all these commercial spaces and I know lots of great businesses that are people-oriented businesses. Um, but then the homeless got worse as I'm walking my dogs at night, and a crime. And so I had to investigate, and boy, oh boy, I can lecture all week. But basically, as an interior architect with background in architecture, city planning, um, LA is kind of chaos with all these maps. So basically, you need to go down to the core problems and find out who the client is. Then for me, since all the big developers have their own interior designers and interior architects and they come in and plop down buildings with their own staff and hire the, have their own people, it's not really good for the local LA people. So I took on a client as the homeless and I walk around Skid Row because I live on Broadway and it's right there and I talk to them and find out and you know, the tents are their homes. Their environments. I design home and business environments. The tents are their homes. So, and, and they don't trust society. So you've got that. And then the public at large believes that the homeless have done something bad to end up there. I know because that's how my family thought of me. Um, cause I'm the artsy designer, you know, I, I don't really fit in. I came out in 89 at the peak of AIDS in San Francisco, you name it. So, Anyway, basically, if I, I, I understand that probably your campaigns were paid for by the developers and real estate companies and all of that because I looked at Weezer's wife's. <laughs> um, anyway, so, you know, I just cut to the chase. You can take care of this. I, I can take care of the problem, you know, by taking on the individual issues and designing them and taking care of having them taken care of with accountability. There's no accountability here. It's these bureaucratic committees and talking and talk. I went to the lots of meetings. I go to deal, I go to all the different meetings, and they don't want to hear me say any answers. They just want to talk about it. So I do have answers, but 
you know, I heard the LASA Finance Committee report and how they were over budget, like, uh, what was it, over half a million per unit. That's ridiculous. Especially the city in control of city property, building. But, all, you know, you can solve it. It's not rocket science. <laughs> but it is happening all around the world. So, um, you know, it's just going to get worse until you actually take the time to pause, understand it, and solve it. Thank you. Wayne Spindler, um, multiple items, two minutes, and general public comment, one minute. It's right. See, we know the foe is here. He, he tipping his head doing the 45 degree, yo. But you know what I here for. I here to talk about Herb Wesson and 1819 Southwestern Avenue. He going to take the casa and turn it into a goddamn homeless shithole. That's what he want to do. Why? Because Herb Wesson, no, he ain't going to go on Vermont. Because the Korean community kicked his ass out of there at that parking lot on 6 in Vermont. There ain't going to be no homeless shelter. It's a nice little parking lot next to the bank where all of my Asian friends go and park their cars. There ain't going to be no temporary nothing. And then he goes down over to my little tennis courts over there at MacArthur Park and called Lafayette Park. And we got two tennis courts. And Herb Wesson said, nigga? And I says, yes, sir, Mr. Wesson. You don't play tennis. I said, I play tennis. He said, shut your fucking mouth. Here's your T-R-O. Here's a piece of bacon. Now put it in your ass and we're going to take it away. And we're going to build a homeless shelter with the only two tennis courts in nine square miles in the ghetto. So you know what? He having problems now because FBI. Hello. Yes, sir. Can I speak to your chief of staff, Dayron Williams, please? Yes, I'm Dayron Williams. I'm the chief of staff for Mr. Herb Wesson. How may I help you? I got these 19 subpoenas. What's that? It's a subpoena. S-U-E-P-E-N-N-I-S. -E -E I got some subpoenas for your boss. So now we got FBI. DOJ, and then we got the six billion dollars on Mikla. And that guy over there, the Socialist America, ain't gonna tell you what Mikla stands for. The Municipal Investment Corporation of Los Angeles. Google it. Mikla. Six billion dollars borrowed against six billion dollars makes. $12 billion, and we pay interest. That's why Marquise getting up. I'm doing the Jew, Jew bird. I'm telling you how the Jews own the city. They got the $6 billion of notes, and we don't have the cash. We don't have the $6 billion is gone. It's, his, it's in Mark Ridley Thomas's pocket. He's taking it to Cuba. So when everybody gets it doubted, Mr. Castro and Mrs. Castro are going to have $6 billion, and I'm going to have Shut up my ass and no motherfucking right, dentist. Now we dog. have Bella DeSoto. Multiple comment cards on multiple items and one minute for general public comment. Two minutes for the others. So how much time do I get? Uh, two minutes for the specific items and then one minute for general public. Okay. And you have items five and six. Right. Well, um, I had to select two. Thank you. I appreciate that you guys uh, converge here today. Um, Proposition HHH is the issue, and getting vendors from all over the place without definite focus on supportive housing for all vacant properties uh, within the area, the tri area of Los Angeles, is a waste. And these funds may be mismanaged, and uh, we feel I am with the stop. Uh, LA Homelessness Now and uh, campaign and solving LA's homelessness crisis must start with City Hall. So we are pressuring all city agencies, also LAUSD, also Metro and others and uh, Board of Supervisors to 
repurpose all their empty, vacant properties throughout the city and repurpose them for the homeless immediately, as soon as possible, with the necessary supportive services. And this is what the Triple H measure should be addressing, nothing else. We have vast properties, empty properties all over, and it's not just made out of concrete. These are properties that are come in all kinds of shapes, all different places, including firehouses. The park center right across the street should have not been demolished. That is another waste. And it should have been repurposed for long-term housing of the homeless. And I help uh, produce change links. We have a community calendar on change links. And uh, one of the articles that was promoted was written by one of our ladies in our group, Why Prop 10 Failed in California in 2018. Uh, with skyrocketing rents, a disastrous housing shortage, and a blue wave questing in the political arena, pro-rent pro control measure should have been a shoo-in in California's November 19, uh, 2018 ballot. However, it went up in flames. And this is what the city should have been supporting, promoting. All around the city, Prop 10 should have won because Prop 10 would start stopping the hemorrhaging of evictions, which is the largest contributor to the homeless crisis around Los Angeles. Prop 10 was very promising. I hope that it comes back again. I hope you take another look at it. It has to be more robust, and it must win. We have to stop the hemorrhaging through evictions throughout the city immediately. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next, we have Carla Alegria, who has filled out uh, cards on multiple items. So two minutes for those items and one minute for public, general public comment. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the In Homelessness Now campaign, as well as the Freedom Socialist Party. And the reason I'm here is because I wanted to speak, speak to you all about some of the, I know the, the city is working on taking some of the vacant properties and turning them into housing now. Um, I think that based on some of the thing, things that we've learned through talking to people and actually speaking to people on some of the uh, city council committees, is that a lot of the, a lot of the HHH money is going into that, but it's going through, going through developers, and the money's going to the developers, to the developers in forms of loans where uh, we want to implore, this, implore you all to, instead of going through the developers, for the city to act as its own developer and create those contracts and hire the contractors directly um, in order to build permanent housing instead of bridge housing that is only temporary and also the housing that's being built by the developers that ends up going, it, it's not a permanent public property. Um, we would like to see that become permanent uh, housing that with supportive services that it continues to be built so that we're able to house the 40,000 plus people who are currently unhoused in the city of Los Angeles. Um, and we really think that the services that go along with that are extremely important in order to help people maintain, uh, maintain their housing because as we know a lot of times People lose their housing because they're not able to, uh, they're not able to maintain it due to health crisis or mental health or a variety of issues. Uh, so we really want to employ you all to do that and to, for the city to be its own developer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, we have uh, Claudia Brick. Yeah. Claudia Brick, you have. Uh, Speaker cards on items five and six. So you have two minutes for those items and then one minute for general public comment. Whoa, look at me. Oh. Good afternoon. Everybody in LA <laughs> knows that there is a homeless crisis in Los Angeles of humongous proportions. 
and people are starting to come around to the idea that the city should use its own properties and the county should use their own properties on which to build. And I have heard that a couple of people think it might even be cheaper and more efficient to, for the city to be its own builder, as if they were building a fire station or a community center. I've heard that there's problems um, maybe trying to get enough qualified employees to do that. But um, HUD just gave uh, Nickerson Gardens $3.7 million grant for its job center. The Black Worker Center also trains people um, to go to work, to hit the workforce. So there really, there really are ways to get this done um, with the will to do it. So um, I have, you know, I'm not going to dig them out now, but I have, you know, sample examples of places that would be appropriate to be built on and ways to do it. So I'm just saying the city should build it, own it, run it, and then the money goes back into the city for maintenance and additional housing, and the public owns the property instead of giving it back to the developers to whom you've already paid hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we're just asking for you folks to step up and get it done. We're going to be like the little terrier dog hanging on to your pant leg until we see some action. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, we have Marianne Curtis. Marianne Curtis, items five and six, and then one minute for public comment, so three minutes total. Uh, members of the committee, thank you for holding this meeting this afternoon so we could all come and speak before you. My name is Marianne Curtis. I'm with the American Federation of State County Municipal Employees Retiree Chapter 36. The last homeless count showed that elders are the largest uh, increasing population of those losing their housing in this city. That has a lot to do with rent controlled properties being torn down and turned into high rise buildings that only the wealthy well to do can afford. Those of us in my labor group are mostly longtime county and city workers who have devoted their lives to public service. And we want you to devote your committee time to looking at the public nature of housing. Housing is a human right. Um, and that you seriously look at these HH, do HHH dollars that the public intended to go to as people are calling the brick and mortar of supporter, supportive housing um, for the unhoused directly. And I think other people have spoken and are articulate on what we're talking about. Today, I was part of a press conference out in front of Parker Center. And the point there was that we want you to set an example by using vacant, properties in City Hall's backyard. The two best examples are the Parker Center. Another example is the park on First between Broadway and Spring that is destined to become another nice park for those who can afford entertainment and such. But you've got people lined up in tents along the fence that separate them from that park. Right. You have the option to do something with that property to provide Housing, permanent supportive housing, quality permanent supportive housing for the unhoused. The UN was here a couple years ago. They toured Skid Row. Their conclusion was that LA has the public resources, they have, you have property, you have money, and the conclusion was is that our officials lack the political will to do what is needed. We're asking you to grow a spine. Grow a spine, yeah. And, and stand up to the developers. 
Stand up to the developers. Use this money for the public, keep it in the public interest, and help the many of us and the many of people that are now on the streets to get back on their feet. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have uh, Val Carlson, items five and six, and one minute on general public comment. Val Carlson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I was also at the uh, press conference um, Ms. Curtis mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, our message at that press conference was that solving LA's homelessness crisis must start in City Hall's backyard. And walking from Parker Center to here, we saw a lot of people huddling under the eaves as it was raining. As if anticipating our message, um, the articles in the, an article in the LA Times this morning uh, came under the title of LA promised more housing for homeless people, but some neighborhoods are way behind. And the message seemed to be that, well, downtown and the South Central are doing better than the 222 units per district that uh, you all set as a goal for HHH money a while back. And so we need to focus on uh, other parts of town. Um, our answer to that is that um, even if there are likely to eventually be 800 or so units in downtown, there's 8,000 people camping all around in downtown. South Central the same way. There's thousands of people for the uh, 600 or so in, in our district, District 8, where I live. The solution has got to be to step out to get more for the money to make it public housing. With the developers, what happens is that that ends up being privately owned. All the rent that people pay, a third of whatever income there is, goes to those private developers. After so many years, those owners of that property don't even have to make it available anymore. And so we end up with nothing for all of our tax money. Um, the Parker Center, the city is the developer for the Parker Center. You're paying $300 million to tear it down and $700 million to build new offices. Uh, everybody in the city has an office now. If they, we took that billion dollars, it's almost as much as HHH, and start putting it into um, the kind of housing that we need much, much more of. Item five today is an RFP where you're asking again more people from the outside to come in and do that development model again. Uh, we need the money to come in, um, be funded by the city, the income from it goes to the city, and it stays public forever. It can be done. It's what we need, and uh, we urge you to do it. I'll presenting and give you a copy of our press packet with some of the statements from people who spoke out there in the rain today. Um, we hope that you will. Uh, we also include their information on five properties, some of them large vacant lots where things could go up immediately. You've heard uh, from a number of people who have ideas about modular housing and the blockable things, things that are cost between fifty and a hundred thousand instead of five hundred thousand per unit. These are the figures and the ways through which uh, you can really maximize this. We need to look at other money, um, like thank that million for the Parker. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll, we'll take a look at your submission. We appreciate that. Uh, next, we have Yuisa Jimeno. At least on here, it's spelled Y-U-I-S-A. Yeah. Uh, Jimeno. Uh, and you have uh, comment cards on five and six, and then one minute for general public. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Uh, my name is Juisa Jimeno. Um, I'm a concerned resident of Councilmember Krikorian's District 2, and I also work for LA County. I'm also a member of SEIU 721. Every day over my cubicle walls, I hear my coworkers, who are Adult Protective Services social workers, desperately looking for a safe and permanent place to live for their homeless or on the verge of eviction elderly clients. Their caseloads climb higher and higher every day as the need for immediate permanent low-income housing explodes. Oftentimes, my coworkers run into obstacles of shelters that don't have beds available, or the client doesn't feel safe going to that shelter, or they simply don't have the bus fare or train fare to get there. I'm sure the clients and workers at the city's Department of Aging face similar issues. 
public sector workers like me live or work in the very communities we are desperately trying to serve. The unhoused are not just our clients, though. They're our neighbors and our family members. As social service providers, we are on the front lines of the housing and homelessness crisis. We desperately try to help unhoused families, older adults, queer and transgender youth get services and a safe place to live, but there isn't enough safe, quality, permanent housing. Imagine if we could refer our homeless clients or our students if we're teachers or even a loved one of our own to a reliable source of permanent supportive housing that is publicly owned, run, and maintained by the city of Los Angeles. That would be a huge relief. We need our elected officials to do more by using the city's resources like your vacant or underutilized buildings and land along with wraparound public social services to solve the crisis. This could actually save lives. I woke up and read today's LA Times article about the units being built in each district. In my district, there's only 121 committed, which doesn't meet the 222 unit promise. That's unacceptable. For District 1, it's nice that 816 units will be built, but there needs to be at least 8,000, as a previous speaker said. All the districts need far more than the numbers shown in today's paper. If you take bolder steps here in the city's backyard, where there's the largest concentration of unhoused people, your example will make it easier for others to do more throughout the city, and you could be a shining example for the County Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Andrea Theodore. Andrea Theodore, you have a, a comment card for item five. You get one minute for that, and then one minute for general public comment. Hello, thank you. Uh, my welcome. name is Andrea Theodore. I'm here with uh, End Homelessness Now LA. We had a press conference across the street. And I think the problem is that there's a disconnect between city government and the public. The public is expecting emergency housing for homeless people now, not in two years, not in three years. So we have to look at <coughs> alternative housing besides Measure HHH. We have to consider housing as a state of an emergency. So we need emergency housing um, in the pipeline now. You know, uh, we need housing equality now, not in two or three years. And the voters, they, they voted thinking that you know, we're going to provide homeless people with housing now. So the, the frustration that, that people feel is that there's a disconnect. There's not a sense of urgency. There's not even a council member for CD14, you know, in the house. You know, it's like we just feel that we're, we're not uh, getting the housing that, that was promised to us. And there, there's ways to address the city lot across the street. You let Hollywood take over with their trailers and pay the city to set up, you know, uh, for uh, movie projects. LA Historic Park, you let people uh, take over for events. It's, a, it's an empty park. It's an empty lot. So we'd like to see, uh, you know, more projects like tiny homes, uh, trailers. You can buy a trailer uh, for 10000 14000 You can... Um, Put 100 on a lot, put 10, put 20, but do something now because you're, there's a lot of frustration and it's just building. So we need a message from the uh, city government and the county saying that, that you know, there is such a thing as emergency housing. Elderly people on the street, unhoused people uh, in the emergency room, you know, they're waiting to be placed into uh, nursing homes and housing. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have Mike Greenspan, uh, one minute for item five and one minute for general public comment. All right, so item five is first, right? Uh, e either or. Oh. Take your pick. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Folks, I'm not the advocate of HHH. After all, it's, I even got on a, an internet ad and I stated, Herb Wesson has a Burger King deal for you, a whopper of a tax. One billion two hundred million dollars. And I stated, no, 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 Mr. Wesson, not another tax. Taxes are to Herb Wesson what affairs are to Newt Gingrich. Neither has ever seen one they didn't like of their favorite category. This is, I told you so, folks. I told you so about this 
H H H. Yeah, I remember one person who actually was at Bill Rosendahl's funeral and sang Susie Williams, and we got into an argument before the election, and she was all for HHH and said, oh, well, there'll be a committee to watch how the funds are monitored. Perhaps HHH should have some vowels. Ha, ha, ha. Now, the city thinks that, well, we can get into the businesses. If you really think the city is capable of doing businesses, maybe, now Monica lives in the valley, and she's seen the city hall at Van Nuys. And you guys occasionally do a cup of coffee. People like Marquise Harris Dawson and Mitch O'Farrell and others, Herb Wesson, do a cup of coffee in the valley. But the, that Marvin Browdy Center has a space for the bottom for businesses. Not one place is there. And we have in front of it homeless people in tents. We'd be better off if we opened up those empty buildings and at least let them go inside and have some facilities for them. Yes, folks, you shouldn't be in the housing business. You shouldn't be in any kind of business than to just get a budget out and do as little as possible because every time you guys do something, you fuck up. All right, colleagues, what I'd like to do now is we'll take items uh, three, four, eight. Uh, and six on consent, if there's no objection. So we'll, we'll, move, we'll move those items forward. Which will, will they need to be read? Yeah. So we'll read those and then we'll take them on consent. Yeah. Can I ask a question about public comments? We didn't sign up. What happened? Uh, we're going to hear more comment, but we heard multiple, multiple items first. So if you're, you're in the system, then you should be fine. You, you're welcome. Yes. Okay. Yep, Jack Reese, CLA's office. Item number three, uh, before I read the blurb, there's a uh, minor amendment to the address was transposed for Canoga, so it should be <coughs> 7621 Canoga Avenue. So uh, item number three, California Environmental Quality Act analysis and Jack, a little more into the microphone, please. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> item number three, California Environmental Quality Act analysis and categorical exemption from CEQA pursuant to Article 19, Sections 15301, Class 1A and B, and 15303, Class 3D and E, as well as City of Los Angeles CEQA guidelines, Article 3, Section 1, Class 1, 1 and 2, and Class 3, 5 and 6, as set forth the notice of exemption attached to Council File and Motion Blumenfield Rose Rodriguez relative to the property located at 7621 Canoga Avenue. Los Angeles, California, 91304, for the purpose of establishing a suitable location for a bridge housing project. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, so, uh, yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, two, oh, all right, they're, they're, they're you know, long <laughs> items, okay. Item number four, motion Rue Harris-Dawson relative to evaluating the property at 3210 and 3248 West Riverside Drive in Las Feliz and Griffith Park to determine if the property is suitable for development as a bridge housing facility. And item number six is city, oh, and, uh, yeah, it's city attorney in Los Angeles Housing and Community Development Investment Department reports an ordinance authorizing the conveyance of three parcels of city-owned real property to 88th and Vermont MGP LLC with conditions assuring the city affordable housing purposes are carried out on the property. And this item is also referred to the Housing Committee. Are we good? Thank you, Mr. Reef. All right, so... Uh, Colleagues, then let's go ahead and take items three, four, and six on consent with no objection. Uh, and Mr. Reef, that brings us to uh, item one. Item number one, motion O'Farrell Harris Dawson relative to an ordinance on the shelter crisis declaration that would align the city's municipal code sections 1280 and 81, 1281 with state government code section 8698 and ensure that the municipal code is not in conflict with existing state and local laws or regulations. All right. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, if there are no objections, what we uh, would like to do here is adopt this uh, motion as amended with the additional new language that the City Council resolved to do the following, uh, to pursue the development of temporary homeless shelters under Government Code Section 8698.4. The City affirms that the same conditions which gave rise to the City's declaration of the shelter crises pursuant to Government Code Section 8698.4 last year continue to exist, specifically that the number of homeless people who need shelter significantly outnumbers the shelter beds that are available to them. Despite the city's notable efforts to develop temporary homeless housing, 
Thus, the city remains in a shelter crisis as defined by Government Code Section 8698, etc. Uh, Madam City Attorney, are we good on that? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. All right, so uh, without objection, we will adopt the motion as amended with the additional language that I just read. All right, so that shall be the order. Uh, and then that will bring us to item two. We do not need temp shelters. We need Okay, that's, housing. you're going to have to not disrupt the meeting. All right, that's your, that's your, that's your first warning. Item uh, number two, California Environmental Quality Act analysis and category exemption from CEQA pursuant to Article 19, Sections 15301, Class 1A and B, 15303, Class 3C, and 15304, Class 4ABE, as well as City of Los Angeles CEQA guidelines, Article 3, Section 1, Class 112, and Class 4136, as set forth in notice of exemption attached to the council file. And motion Weston Jr. Cedillo O'Farrell relative to the bridge housing facilities on city owned site at 19, 1819 Southwestern Avenue and CEQA analysis and category exemption for CEQA pursuant to Article 19, Sections 15301, Class 1H, 15303, Class 3C, and 15304, Class 4ABE, as, and the city's CEQA guidelines, Article 3, Section 1, Class 1812, and Class 4136 is set forth in the notice of exemption attached to the council file. And motion West and City or O'Farrell relative to the bridge housing facilities on city owned site at 625 Lafayette Place. Thank you. And I understand we have Meg Barkley from the CAO's office to give uh, an update and present some amendments. Yes, good afternoon, Meg Barkley, uh, City Homeless Coordinator in the CAO's office. Just a, a minor amendment to the motion to add um, an additional recommendation within the second either for move clause, um, uh, which would be to, to approve the, the use of $350,000 from um, the Department 50 Appropriation 50R VDI crisis. One moment, Meg. Housing one moment. Get out of here. What, one moment. Okay, everyone, just cool it, please. Let's get through this, and I'm sure she'll, she's happy to speak up, but let's not have any more outbursts, all right? I, I really appreciate that. Ms. Barkley, please continue. So the recommended language would allow the Bureau of Engineering to use $350,000 from currently appropriated funds to start the CEQA analysis and geotechnical activities associated with these two sites prior to a development agreement being in place and to reimbur be reimbursed from the funds in this motion. This would just allow those studies to begin prior to the development agreement with the developer. Okay. All right, thank so, you. so this language would just allow BOE to be reimbursed from the funds in this motion and allow the project to begin, um, to begin these studies as soon as possible. All right. Um, colleagues, do we have any questions or comments about this item? No. Seeing as that there are none, uh, I'm going to recommend that we approve the motion as amended along with the BOE CEQA determinations. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That will be the order. Uh, I'd like to now go to item 5. Um, and um, Mr. Reef, if you'll please read item five into the record. Item number five, Proposition HHH Administrative Oversight Committee report relative to the request for approval to release the Prop HHH Housing Challenge request for proposals. Thank you. And I understand Meg Barkley is going to make a reappearance. Uh, and we have from the Mayor's Office, Ben Winter, City Attorney's Office, Michael Heinrichs, uh, for an overview. Hey, Mr. Spindler, you have been disrupting quietly all along, and so that's your warning. No more disruptions, no more applause, no more animal sounds. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Ben Winter from the Mayor's Office. Um, so we're pleased to be here today to present to you all uh, this draft request for proposals with HZLA and the CAO. Uh, that you want to hold for just a moment where he's disrupting on the way out. So let's just give him his moment and then we'll continue. Sorry, 
All right. Please continue. Sorry about that. Yes, sir. Um, so we're pleased to present the, R, the this draft RFP to this committee that is uh, trying to seek innovative ways to deliver high-quality supportive housing projects in a cost-effective and timely way. Uh, the process to develop this RFP actually started almost a year ago uh, when Councilmember Harris Dawson introduced a motion that requested the Prop HHH Citizens Oversight Committee to develop recommendations to expedite the delivery of supportive housing. Uh, since then, the COC formed a working group and uh, that recommended that the city create a separate pilot program that would uh, fund alternative methods of financing and or constructing supportive housing with the goal of producing 1,000 units. Uh, in January of this year, the council and mayor approved setting aside 10% of the total Prop HHH bonding authority uh, for this initiative, which is equivalent to up to $120 million. Uh, and directed the mayor's office, HCID, and the CAO to develop detailed program regulations for the program. And that's what's before you today. Uh, since January, HCID LA, the mayor's office and CAO have drafted this Prop HHH housing challenge request for proposals uh, and received comments and redline suggestions from both the COC and AOC, which are reflected in the draft that's before you uh, with their recommendations to move this forward. So what's before you today uh, at a high level is an RFP that's designed to solicit the best and brightest ideas uh, from the private sector. And to get those ideas, we intentionally designed it to be different than RFPs that you might be uh, familiar with in the past. And the two ways, the two things that I think uh, summarize why it's so different, one is because this RFP will for the first time allow the city to effectuate enterprise level funding to uh, strong development teams with a reservation of funds that they can use to secure, secure private financing and acquire sites in the, private, in the private market. The second reason why this RFP is a little different is because it's intentionally structured as a more of a low barrier uh, application that gives the private sector flexibility to, to describe their unique way uh, that they'd like the city to fund their development strategies. So applications to the RFP would first undergo a threshold review process, an underwriting review process, and then it would be scored based on a number of other evaluation criteria uh, that's described in the RFP. Uh, an evaluation panel would give each applicant a score based on how creative, feasible, and scalable their proposals are, and there are additional points if they ask for less Prop HHH subsidy or if they have more... Um, uh, they choose fast entitlement and construction paths or propose uh, developments with on-site amenities, things like that. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Sean Spear, uh, Assistant General Manager from HZLA, to walk you through some more of the details of the RFP. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Sean Spear from the department. I uh, wanted and as we back up and just say that as uh, Ben articulated, we've endeavored to create a process that should hopefully foster uh, ideas and projects that would uh, be able to generate new uh, supportive housing deals that it would be hopefully delivered faster and cheaper. Uh, as Ben mentioned, the, this challenge is really focused on being as open as possible and seeing where we can perhaps foster uh, new innovative approaches to the delivery of supportive housing. Nevertheless, I wanted to uh, take a couple minutes just to highlight some of the key features of the RFP. Uh, the first is that it's essentially structured as two, two buckets, and the first being that um, project sponsors could uh, submit individual projects for which they have site control over. Uh, there's a criteria and evaluation criteria specifically focused on that piece. An alternative is they can uh, present a program strategy which would ultimately produce multiple projects down the road. And so the nature of the commitment in that case would be a commitment to, that, to their actual program that they could hopefully then take and uh, use to leverage additional resources for the projects that they would ultimately uh, be moving forward with. Emphasis is that um, all housing uh, typologies will be considered, uh, provided that they can achieve uh, regular permitting through our planning and um, building and safety processes, as well as obtain a certificate of occupancy at the end of the day. Uh, these typologies would, of course, include uh, not only sort of traditional supportive housing and individual units, but also can be shared housing as well, and other ideas that folks may come up with will be considered. 
Uh, the applicants must demonstrate that uh, because this is a special challenge, um, that they must actually show that their proposal otherwise would not either be eligible or would be infeasible under the regular HHH program. It's important to emphasize that this is special funds to dedicated to new and innovation where they might not have been able to apply under the regular program otherwise. Uh, other emphasis is that um, the projects will receive uh, up to $140,000 per unit um, in the form of a subordinate loan for the projects. However, a uh, proposal can come in with uh, requesting m amounts additional or above that $140,000. But in that case, that delta, that difference between the 140 and whatever they're requesting, must be repaid once the project is completed uh, within three years after that completion date. Um, the other factors are is that development teams must also include a property manager and a service provider that are experienced with serving homeless populations. Uh, all supportive housing units must be connected to the coordinated entry system and uh, must serve households making below 50% of AMI. Uh, all projects will be, uh, just as in the regular program, will, must commit to 55 years worth of affordability and provide provision of the supportive housing. All projects must conform, nevertheless, to standard um, development-related policies, particularly on the city, state, and federal levels, uh, which would include CEQA, uh, ADA requirements, uh, as well as uh, the uh, HHH uh, project labor agreement requirement for projects that are over 65 units. Um, projects must uh, emphasize that there is also on-site service provision uh, for the residents there, as well as uh, services to be provided for them. Another emphasis that was actually recommended out of the, uh, the Administrative Oversight Committee was that uh, there would be no displacement of existing residents at sites as well. So that is part of the proposal as per that. Yep. So that uh, concludes our remarks on this. I think we're all, right. all available for any questions you may have. That concludes have. everyone's remarks. All right. Um, I'll tell you what. Uh, let's, let's start with you, Mr. Harris-Dawson, questions or comments, and then uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Thank you so much. Um, Mr. Chair uh, and members, and thank all of you who've uh, gotten this proposal in front of us, and uh, as well as I want to acknowledge the leadership of the Oversight Committee uh, who pushed hard to uh, tear down the walls. Just, I just wanted to give a little bit of context to everybody that's here in the audience, but also for the record. Uh, we, uh, in our first year of funding projects, and HHH started getting very, very concerned because the cost per unit seemed to skyrocket. Uh, the time that it took, as many speakers uh, referred to earlier in public comment, the time that it was taking um, wasn't getting any faster and the price wasn't going down at all. And so we said, let's make sure that, the, in fact, what's causing that is not something that originates uh, with the city. Uh, even though we're only a small part of uh, funding each uh, unit. And so we have before us a proposal, or at least the skeleton, or the, the main parts of our proposal that sort of throws open the doors uh, for that. Uh, and I think everything is, um, I think this is going in exactly the right direction. I have a couple questions about uh, a couple items uh, that are, that are uh, fairly narrow and I think can be addressed uh, that I wanted to sort of get your opinion about. If uh, my understanding about both the property manager and the service provider having experience with the specific population, uh, I had a specific question um, about that. So eventually we run out of people who've done this work because we're building housing, right? And so people are getting work. So eventually you won't have people who have managed homeless senior housing facilities, but we still need to build senior housing facilities, for example. So the question becomes, what do you do in that situation? And I want to understand, is this written to mean, because I wasn't quite clear, was this written to mean a person who's managed a senior housing facility that isn't homeless people, would that count? Is there something particular about people who are homeless that having managed a housing facility with that special needs population wouldn't count? Mm -hmm. uh, or is this 
meant to suggest if a person managed a senior housing facility, they could qualify and come over and manage a homeless senior housing facility. Yeah, I think the initial thought is and it's a, a, an important one because this this speaks to the heart of the capacity of the of the mm -hmm. of the industry to absorb this amount of new projects that will be coming down the road. Uh, the thought is that these would be while we want to figure out how to deliver these units faster. Uh, at the end of the day, um, the emphasis is on uh, having a team in there once it's operating that is experienced and, and, and knows the somewhat unique issues that may come up with a given population and how to match up, in fact, the, the operation of the site with the services that are provided. So the expectation is, is that they would have experience specifically in providing service-enriched uh, 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 provisions on site and that they would have done that in previous times before. That being said, I think there is some openness depending on if they're looking at addressing that concern in a different way, I think that's certainly something that would be considered under the RFP. Uh, so, Councilman, I think I would add that initially, I think as Sean mentioned, we really wanted to require the minimum yeah. requirements, right? And so one of the things that we did, as you, as you probably noticed, is that developers are actually not required to have right. experience with supportive housing because we felt if you can develop a good housing project, mm -hmm. that's really the key here. Right. Right, but when it comes to services and ensuring that uh, units, especially supportive housing for the homeless or chronically homeless, it's really critical that the people managing the property and the service provider have the experience to do it. Mm -hmm. And we felt that was the critical part for this RFP. And I would add as part to your first part of your question, um, LASA as well as others like Corporation for Supportive Housing are looking at providing training services and ability to sort of get more people in the industry yeah. that would ultimately be ready to uh, work at the properties once they're completed. I, yeah, I appreciate the sensitivity to particularly neighborhoods that these facilities will go in that the people in, in the management of the building actually have the capacity to do so. Um, I, I just I would forward the or, or put on the table for consideration the notion that that chronically uh, the homeless population uh, homelessness is not a particular condition that requires special services for everybody. I might argue that chronic homelessness it might be a condition that does, but I, I, I have a hard time understanding if a person's managed a transitional age youth facility and I need them to manage a transitional age youth facility where the people had been homeless for a few months. I mean, they're transition age, so they couldn't have been homeless very long. They're not old enough. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't, I, I, I just worry that that might be a barrier that's not necessary. Um, if, I, I care more about someone going to the facility that they manage to see how it's managed than I care about if the people in the facility had ever been homeless at one point. You know, to me, if you know how to work with transition age people, God bless you. Like, you probably could, you can probably figure it out uh, if they've been homeless, yes. If, if I may, sir, uh, council member, I think there's, um, you know, if we look at the eligibility requirements and the mm -hmm. thresholds for the property manager, yeah. uh, it, uh, we require they have experience in managing at least 50 units for the right. past three years with persons with special needs. So that special needs definition is, is a little You feel like that's broad enough? Okay. For the property managers. When it comes to the service provisions, though, that's when we're trying to really get at the specifics. That makes sense. We want, we want, if, you know, we want these proposals to be very specific and clear about what uh, target populations they're going to serve, right. and then we want to see um, the service provider have that experience. So I think you'll kind of see as you go down this line, we want, you know, more specific experience. So developer doesn't have to have that much experience. You get bonus points if you do mm -hmm. have experience sure. working with affordable housing, but it's not a requirement. Property management, special needs, and then it gets more specific. Got so the special needs category is, is, is the broadest one that would cover the things that I've just raised here. I think so. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. My next... Uh, a uh, set, couple sets of questions is, um, uh, or, or things I'd like to, ideas I'd like to posit with you all in the committee, is in the criteria, uh, I see, uh, you know, 20 points for development strategy, 15 for organizational structure, 10 for design features, 20 for financing, 
15 for permitting, uh, which seems like we have a lot of say over. Um, so I'm not sure why we hold the applicant responsible for that. Um, and then 20, construction timeline. Uh, the part that jumped out at me was the lowest category, which is design. Um, and in, in the innovation fund, I, I don't want to advantage someone who gives a very simplistic, unimaginative, uninnovative design. I don't want to give that person a, a advantage over someone who tries to put forward an innovative design. Because the, you know, if, if you present a box with a window and a door, that's going to be easier to permit mm -hmm. than someone who gives an innovative design. So, that, so the way we have this lined up, there's no compensation, right? So, and in fact, um, you know, I think it, it looks at amenities, it looks at community amenities. Like, just what about putting a pretty building in a neighborhood? Like, mm -hmm. should, I, I just feel like that should count for something. Um, and design is one of those things that means a lot to a neighborhood that doesn't actually cost that much to the bottom line of it. I mean, so. Yep. I, I'm mm -hmm. cu curious about that and concerned about that. It's, it's a very good point, and, and um, I think it's, it's definitely something that's important. Uh, just to, on the streamlining permitting issue, I think a lot of that is within our capability, within the city's purview, but really um, what we're trying to do there is if folks are coming forward with a development strategy and they don't yet have site control, we would rather them not look for sites that need major entitlements. Got it. Okay. We, you know, we want to give extra points if you're looking for more buy right strategies. You're using the TOC. You're doing some other of these buy right strategies. So I think that kind of gets at the timing issue, which was, I think, one of the major concerns that the COC was bringing. It, so it, it might be useful to spell that out. Yeah. 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 Um, on the design, I think that's a really good point. It's um, some of the design features, there's some objective criteria that are pretty easy to score. If you have complete units, that's easy to figure out in a scoring criteria. Right. Um, if there's a more subjective decision about, well, what's good design in a neighborhood, I think it re that, that's more difficult to score, but we did try to incorporate that here um, on three, the panel design review. So gave like a little bit of a four-point scale for uh, um, the, the, the panel review there. On design, but that certainly could be beefed up if that's. Yeah, I would. I would love some more thought on thinking about how to encourage innovative design, the same way we're encouraging innovative <laughs> financing and innovation in all the other areas. I think that's very, very important. And then my last uh, question, <laughs> Mr. Chair, is connected to that. Uh, I did. It may be here, but I didn't necessarily see it. Um, how are we scoring folks on their community outreach and community engagement in the neighborhoods that they're seeking to build, right? So do we, does, I don't want to put folks at an advantage who don't say anything at all to the neighbors ever until yeah. it comes up, you know? Mm -hmm. if, if someone says, I'm going to do the work to go out to the neighborhood as I'm developing this, and they can demonstrate that in their application, I'd want them to get some advantage over someone who didn't. So that's the uh, the other piece I'd put put forward. Yeah. I'd love to hear any comments or thoughts you have on that, yes. but that that concludes my questions, Mr. Chair. Okay. So we could we could definitely add. I thought it was in here, but we mm -hmm. could add an outreach strategy okay. section. Yeah, have them describe it. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Harris Dawson, for those that line of questioning. Design is an important element. Um, <clears throat> it's one that often uh, people really take for granted. But when we are placing this housing in our neighborhoods, one of the easiest way to help get folks more comfortable with the idea is that it doesn't look like a box or some type of, you know, things that would not be, particularly when much of the housing is being located uh, amongst other uh, housing types. We want to make sure that uh, it looks contiguous and, and that uh, it doesn't stand out in, in a, an adverse way. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I had a question. So I know it was, ra you know, brought to the attention. It was corrected on the requirement that the, uh, the displacement 
that we avoid displacement uh, through the development of, of these, uh, these properties. And as it relates specifically to the conversion of uh, the residential hotel, how is this uh, differ? How are the requirements differed from what is uh, prescribed as part of the motel conversion ordinance? What would the differences in that, what, are, what does that look like? Or are there differences? At this standpoint, there's a specific guidance in the HHH regulations around adaptive reuse. And specifically, it talks about that existing residential units are not permitted to be used for HHH in terms of acquisition, rehabilitation, things like that. There is provision if there is new units being created above and beyond, basically on a two-to-one ratio. If you're doubling the number of units, then a project can be considered. Um, at this standpoint, we're not expecting, um, the, we are not specifying any difference from that in terms of what's in the guidelines, but maybe you want to speak a little bit about where we're at in other discussions. Yeah, sure. Um, so as, as Sean mentioned, the existing regulations for Triple H are for new construction and adaptive reuse. Um, so acquisition rehab or redevelopment of existing housing is allowed if there's a two-for-one replacement. Um, this particular RFP was structured to be a pretty low barrier uh, RFP and to kind of open that up a little um, to allow for alternative development strategies. So you could imagine um, more smaller scale development strategies in, uh, in lower density neighborhoods. Um, some of those requirements to do a two for one might be more difficult. Um, and so. I think we've conferred with the city attorney to ensure that that was allowed under legally underneath the Triple H ordinance. So if you want to make a comment on that. Uh, yes, so um, there, there have been questions raised about exactly how Triple H funds can be used. Um, and so I, we wanted you all to know that the city attorney's office was involved from the beginning with HHH in um, making sure that even reuse is something that's allowable under how the ballot measure was phrased and also with respect to the use of general obligation bonds under state law, and it is. I think what um, the displacement issue and some of these other issues that are raised, they're still important ones, of course, and um, really, in our view, they're policy matters for this body and the council as a whole to decide how we want to structure the RFP, um, how we want to make those uh, decisions on on exactly what we're allowing, maintaining flexibility, but also protecting existing tenants. Mm -hmm. so, so to give an example, let's say there's a small scale five unit derelict residence, uh, uh, existing building that has been vacant for 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that would not be allowed under the existing Triple H regulations, right? So if there is some of that, some very underutilized housing stock out there that you know, could be activated with, uh, with a little bit of rehab and a new mission-driven developer and turn that market rate development into long-term affordable housing with the covenant with supportive services on site, that kind of development strategy is not allowed. So the idea for this RFP is if it is allowed legally under the ordinance, if this is our one-time shot to kind of open up all different kinds of strategies to get, um, to create affordable housing, specifically supportive so affordable housing, then this could be that one opportunity to do it, not changing the bread and butter HHH program. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I have a, a, a few questions to ask, but I want to start with the whole displacement piece. It's, it's in my, uh, on my list here. It's my understanding that the RFP draft has already been amended to require no displacement. Is, is that accurate? Correct. Mm -hmm. All right, and so the details of exactly what that means, I'm sure, will be more fleshed out. Perhaps as the example that Ben just gave, if it is a 10-year-old, a, a derelict property that's been vacant for 10 years, it could be determined that even if it was once an RSO, but you're going to repurpose it for permanent supportive housing, that that wouldn't necessarily uh, be defined as displacement since it's been vacant for so long. That's just an example. Uh, so, so that criteria will have to be uh, very articulated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so because displacement, of course, is an issue. Mm -hmm. um, but, and I was gonna talk about, in terms of uh, Mr. Harris Dawson and, and Ms. Rodriguez both mentioned 
uh, aesthetics. Uh, and not only is it important for a structure to look really good for the neighborhood, but it's really important for the person who's occupying the space. And that shouldn't be lost either. Uh, mm -hmm. We know that spaces can inspire and make you feel better about your immediate surroundings. And I think it's a really wonderful opportunity. No one expects, you know, the, the Rolls Royce of, you know, homes or apartments. God knows that's not where I live either. But, but spaces that, that respect the individual, I think, are, are um, important uh, in, this, in this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, my questions. Uh, I'd like you to explain the, how the RFP's proposal allows the $40 million reservation piece of, of this RFP for Prop HH uh, funds mm -hmm. um, and in relation to the $120 million for the innovation um, mm -hmm. uh, project. Yep. Uh, can, what does that mean? Does that mean that the RFP could be awarded to just three projects if three projects are scaled out to cost up to $40 million each. Could you just elaborate on, on that arrangement? Sure. So I think the, the concept of this is, um, I forgot who, who brought this up to me when they were reading it, but it's sort of like a hunting license. And I don't hunt, so I, mm -hmm. I don't know if this is a good analogy. <laughs> My brothers do. But think about it like if you've, um, you know, we've structured this, this application, a specific application, right, asking for development teams to put together their best and brightest ideas to go out there and acquire sites pursuant to a very specific strategy. And so uh, if they would be selected and raised to the top, um, then the city, you know, process would set aside a reservation of up to $40 million. That isn't, uh, that isn't a, a conditional approval that individual projects get, right? right? So with that reservation, that reservation is only good for four months because this is supposed to be a quick process. Mm -hmm. um, and if they're going out there and looking for parcels that, you know, are, need major entitlements and can't really go through the process, then maybe that's not the right strategy. So they would be available for four months. And then um, once uh, that agreement is signed for the four-month reservation, then they would go out acquire parcels, and then turn individual parcels into conditional approvals for individual projects. Mm -hmm. Those conditional approvals, currently they're 24 months long. In this program, it's only 12 months long because we're really hoping to get quicker projects. Um, so if during those four months that development team cannot uh, actually acquire sites to meet the total amount that they're looking for, then that reservation goes away. Is there a threshold that must be met per applicant? For example, you don't just, someone just comes in with a highfalutin idea and says, we've got it and we're going to apply for the 40 million, so we need you to hold on for four months while we, you know, uh, while we coalesce all the resources to make this happen. And meanwhile, they're just wasting everyone's time and we're losing four months. So is there a threshold that must be met per applicant so that you have a pretty good sense that they're going to be good for their commitment before? It yep. goes to the next step. So I think that's the evaluate where the evaluation criteria comes in. Um, we're structured the application uh, to be very specific about what we want to see from the development uh, teams. Um, for instance, we'd like for them to show us uh, a market feasibility study that these parcels exist. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the evaluation panel can give feasibility scores on their proposals. And if uh, we, the, the city's evaluation team, sees that it's a, a wacky idea and they didn't provide sufficient evidence and of course their score would be very low and then would, they'd rise to the bottom. And would you also, oh, oh go ahead, Yeah, I please. would just add that mm -hmm. even, to the even if right. they are awarded that then there is, there's an initial two month period where there's a, a more mm -hmm. thorough discussion with that, that sponsor around their strategy and the timeline needed in order to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. Then there's that additional four months for them to actually s secure sites mm -hmm. and as Ben mentioned, the commitments then are, are in a very general sense to their program, but the actual dollar commitments are for individual projects. So it's sort of like the first budget. Right. So, so no, no general obligation bonds would be sold for this initial reservation at all. Mm -hmm. right. um, 
In fact, they don't get sold for the conditional approvals either, right? So no. It's really mm -hmm. When they're no. ready to. Right. Until they're ready to expend, that's when we will issue bonds mm -hmm. or we program funds. Mm -hmm. And that's outlined in the measure itself that exactly. voters approved. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, prevailing wage. Does the state law uh, exemption preempt any law or policy? Um, just to reiterate, we know that all HH projects could potentially qualify for prevailing wage exemption per state law if they meet specific criteria. Is, is that correct? That's correct, yes. Yeah. And I would say that um, under the existing HHH program, uh, the, the way that the possible labor code exception that's already state law could be applied, you can only have one single source of public funding. Those types of projects just aren't what HCID normally deals with in, in terms of they're paired with bonds or tax credits, other sources that would bring them again into prevailing wage. Mm -hmm. So we are outlining in the RFP what is an existing exception that parties might qualify for uh, so long as the only source of public funding they were getting is this HHH loan. And the loan program that Sean outlined is essentially it it meets all of the specific requirements that are set out in the exception to Section 1720 of the Labor Code, which defines public works projects. We would say, though, um, you know, what we, what we as a city cannot do with this RFP is waive existing ordinances. An ordinance is an ordinance. So, for instance, the, the PLA, the HHH PLA, would apply for all projects funded here if they meet the PLA's thresholds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, just jumping right ahead. Uh, for projects that can potentially receive a per unit subsidy in excess of 140000 if that excess amount can be repaid in three years, right, that's, uh, that's how this is uh, uh, envisioned, how do these projects uh, and the, the project teams prove they can repay the funds in three years? Is there a cap on additional funding? Well, that, that, in fact, will be part of the feasibility analysis that the team mm -hmm. would do is to confirm whether or not it's realistic for them to be able to pay, repay those dollars within three years after completion. And is HCID planning on underwriting this? The collective Basically, process. it's a loan program, essentially. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, review panels. Mm -hmm. So is, is the review conducted in a public hearing? Um, publicly noticed? Brown Act? noticed uh, and are there any any additional information in relation to the review panels I, I think I can say in, in terms of scoring that's all done privately that's not the scoring is done privately yes now the the process allows for essentially um, both the threshold review and scoring process and then a, essentially a public meeting that parties can go to to get feedback on the process correct mm -hmm. um, and I think Ben or Sean can outline how that works, but there is, there is a, a way, a method within this process that does have more public comment, mm -hmm. um, but the actual scoring of each individual project is still done privately. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the score, uh, yeah. yeah. So I would add that it's mm -hmm. extremely important, right, because unlike the county competition, this is up to 120 million of general obligation bonds, and we have to create housing units with these funds. So there would be, of course, a threshold review is a pass-fail, and you're really just scoring that the applicants submit all the required documents, do they qualify. The next scoring is really on their proposal itself, and that would be done by qualified underwriters, which I can tell you I'm not one of those people, but mm -hmm. it has to be done by an underwriter because they have to assess whether it's financially feasible. Mm -hmm. Then, if there's another type of review for design and other things, then you can have other panels. But that financial feasibility is very critical because if it's not financially feasible, that project should be scoring a zero and not move on to the rest of the review. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, mm -hmm. uh, just a couple other things here. Um, you know, the the people who get selected, the applicants that get selected here, will have will go to the COC. Mm -hmm. AOC and back right. to the council. So there will be that the public process. The existing infrastructure of the HHH Correct. disbursement. Yeah, Correct. okay. And then um, the actual individual, pro so remember we've got this hunting license here. Mm -hmm. um, that is not the actual loan. Um, that is a prop HHH reservation. So we'll have people underwriting the feasibility of, the, of that concept. 
but then when it comes down to individual projects, there's no individual project that would not be underwritten and thoroughly examined for feasibility by the department and the city. Um, so there'll be a whole nother level of underwriting scrutiny as well during that process when they're ready to go into a conditional approval. Okay. A long time with the license before you give them a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of training. Um, <laughs> Only for a month. Yeah, and, and maybe we move away from this hunting uh, metaphor. <laughs> I don't know why it's the, I, I swear I'm not a hunter. Uh, <clears throat> for anyone who knows how I feel, who I, how I feel about these. Yeah, I, uh, there you go. That's a little nice. Anyone who knows how I feel about the NRA, you know. All right. Um, uh, so, so some of this can be uh, included in the report back. But, for example, the whole displacement thing, I really want to just explore all possible unintended consequences related to displacement and then relocation should that occur. And maybe it's built in that it simply does not, will not, cannot. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to make a point that the way this uh, AOC amendment to the RFP, which basically states that if the project entails permanent displacement, then the, the project wouldn't be eligible. Okay. Um, so it doesn't really allow for relocation because, because if, if you did, um, many of those people that are relocated may not qualify for the unit if if these units are all supportive housing, mm -hmm. right? So they may not qualify because they're not homeless. You obviously relocated them to another unit, mm -hmm. but they also may not qualify because of income, right? Mm -hmm. So it it really um, dis disincentivizes, I would say, mm -hmm. rehabbing buildings that are occupied, which is what, in a sense, I think many people don't want us to do because that's when we displace people. Right. If otherwise, it'd be. I hate to say this, but shooting ourselves in the foot. Um, all right, and then um, in, when you come back, I, I, I hope you'll go over the eligibility requirements for proposers to, to the fine detail, uh, and uh, then the various committees part in that, including the AOC, the Administrative Oversight Committee, and then um, the, uh, the Prop HHH um, Permanent Supportive Housing Program requires a service plan. Does the RFP in the challenge request, um, does it require a service plan for these units? And, and Mr. Harris Dawson went in that direction already, but... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have to look at the application in the appendix here. Uh, so page 20 mm -hmm. is uh, in the application uh, process. So this is the information that we're requiring that applicants give to the city through the RFP. Mm -hmm. uh, require, it's the target population and service plan for the supportive housing units. So this is a section that where applicants would demonstrate an understanding of who they're serving and what are their unique needs. And then they would describe the target homeless populations to be served. Um, and we're asking for the following information, details of the services to be provided by the target population, the frequency of services, how you intend to monitor clients' participation in services and measurement of those clients' successful completion of services, evidence of planned utilization of the coordinated, coordinated the CES, yeah. uh, the number of units targeted to the following populations, yada, yada. So I think this is the, the section where we, we try to get at that. Okay. I, I mean, I think, I think it's a, a very big yes, it does. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, Mr. Spear, you brought up um, qualifications for 50% below AMI. So we're talking about, are we talking about a blend of extremely low income and formerly homeless individuals? So on the, the actual Triple H ordinance that the voters pass, mm -hmm. um, the definition, so that the, the 10,000 units that we're all counting here is kind of, we have to look back at that ordinance where it specifies that the PSH units um, are, are for persons formerly um, experiencing homelessness and that they're below 50% of the area median income. Mm -hmm. Triple H, as you know, can go high, we can fund affordable housing up to 80%. Um, and I think we are, this program is certainly not precluding any kind of mixed income developments whatsoever, 
but in terms of trying to make sure that we're reaching that 10,000 unit goal for supportive housing, mm -hmm. we're really trying to focus the funding of Triple H for those units that are that meet that 10K goal. So uh, this particular program would not fund affordable units in these buildings, but that's not to say that they can't find another innovative financing strategy, maybe get uh, project-based uh, vouchers that could leverage um, other private capital to cover that gap. Okay, as part of a project, for example, where that are gonna be co-located with permanent supportive housing. This would not preclude that from happening. Okay, great, all right. Um, all right, require. so, well, well, thank you. Uh, any other questions, colleagues? Appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to take public comment on this item now. Um, there are some comment cards specific to item number one. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for your, yeah, um, before we make recommendations. And we're going to start with uh, Barbara Schultz, Adam Rice, Catherine Jara, and Steve Diaz. If you could all step forward, uh, and maybe we can find another couple of chairs, and uh, to go, and we can. The chairs. Okay, they're just low. I can't see them. Um, all right. So Barbara Schultz, Adam Rice, Catherine Jara, and Steve Diaz, and you all have one minute uh, each. Right. Uh, good afternoon, Barbara Schultz, Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles, uh, representing LA Can. Um, when Angelinos voted for HHH, we believe that we voted to fund new housing, as that's additional units are needed to alleviate the homeless crisis. Using HHH money to acquire or rehabilitate existing housing betrays both the voters' trust and also, we believe, unlike the city attorney, violates the intent of the voter initiative, and we are confident that it will be found unlawful by a court. Um, please review the example of the Royal Park Hotel in our demand letter, an existing residential hotel funded by HHH in violation of current regulations. This landlord was sued for using a variety of unlawful business practices in order to displace his poor tenants. The city's response was to provide $10.2 million of HHH funds and tax credit funding in order to create affordable housing for other poor tenants. Uh, my time. Thank you. This, oh, attempt, we, this attempt to rush new housing into the pipeline we, we is an incredible waste of care. taxpayer money, and we urge you not to do that. Thank you. Sir, you still have your time. <laughs> right on. Well, Council Member Harris Dawson made an important point earlier. Um, of course, the price per unit went up because the vultures smell blood in the water. As Sister Barb was just discussing, the Royal Park Motel could be eligible for $10.2 million from Triple H. But the Royal Park Motel is not eligible at all. <laughs> so tenants filed in March 2018, uh, extremely low income tenants, tenants rights groups filed a lawsuit against this hotel because of uh, uh, habitability violations, rent control ordinance violations, uh, and illegal evictions. How does this hotel come under that funding? That's maybe something some of the councilmen didn't think about. I know some of the more corrupt ones did. But some of the good ones maybe didn't think that slumlords would be on the list, too. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Catherine Jara and Steve Diaz. Mm -hmm. Council members, good evening. Um, AJ Tate was passed for new housing. So my ask today is that that stay the focus. I know there's a lot of need for other things, but this was focused on that, and if, I mean, just please don't use it for rehab because we do need more, just more. That's what I'm asking for. Thank you. Thank you. After Steve Diaz, it will be Rachel Wells, uh, Key, K-E-I, uh, and David Howden. K left. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is Steve Diaz, and I am with the organization known as LA Can. I'm here today to support, as many other speakers have said, the need not to include rehabilitation of existing housing as part of this innovative pilot program. The importance of the pilot program is to create additional housing and create a net gain, not help facilitate a net loss. The example that was mentioned by the Royal Park can happen again by the way the current regulations are set. Our goal is to ensure that folks are able to provide, or be, are 
are able to be provided with extremely low income housing and that the 10,000 units that were originally promised to the voters are met. By allowing rehabilitation to be included, it creates a loophole to ensure that at the end of the day, we might end up getting lesser amount of units than we originally intended. Thank you. Thanks. All right, Rachel Wells. All right. Hi, my name is Rachel Wells. I'm a volunteer with LA CAN. I, like many other voters, voted for HHH because we need more housing. In order to address the problems of homelessness, the solution is more housing. And so we voted on this so that we could add units to the housing stock. So I'm here with a concern about rehab and using HHH money for units which have, could have existing tenants in them. We should not be using HHH money to displace current tenants so I'm here to urge you to use sort of the original purpose of HHH and not to include rehab as a qualifying use. Thank you. Thank you. And after uh, K, is that right? No, K-E-I. Okay, not here. All right, so David Howden, right, followed, uh, will be followed by Matt Nichols, Friedel Cushman, and Chris Roth. Hi, good afternoon. David Howden, uh, director of the CSH office in Los Angeles. As a partner of uh, the city investing in these same projects, um, we work closely with HSED and the mayor's office, et cetera, to ensure the success and want to maximize uh, the impact of these funds. Um, through our 30 years of experience throughout the country working with communities to build supportive housing, we know that the development is a first step and not the long uh, term. Uh, goal of these dollars and want to remind folks that it is a long-term tenancy and supports that it takes and experience uh, providers doing that uh, of all of all types um, that get us to that true measure of success uh, in achieving those goals. Um, so we want to make sure and emphasize that it Evidence has shown it is only through the long-term committed experience partnerships um, and that dynamic partnership between the developer, service provider, and property management that allows this to be possible and provides the supports necessary um, for the tenants to be stable and remain in okay. housing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matt Nichols, Reed L. Cushman, and Chris Roth. Uh, Matt Nichols here with DLA Piper. Uh, here on behalf of, um, we represent multiple affordable housing developers. I'm here to speak to um, some, there, first of all, the excitement over the HHH challenge language and the opportunity it presents for uh, the ideas from the private sector to uh, help solve the city's affordable housing problem. Um, and also offer two suggestions, which I think um, made to the current language would, would open, open the program up to these developers and, and help them get to uh, build or bring on affordable housing. The first one is the current eligibility requirements uh, on page five, I believe, of the, uh, of the language, which cites to the experience required of the developer. Uh, at the moment, it's two projects um, in two years. Um, we would ask that be removed um, and that, that just be, uh, continue to be in the scoring section. And also the bond issuer, we would ask that Cal PFA or, or other options other than uh, HSED be allowed in the event that HSED cannot meet the um, current timelines. Okay. Uh, we understand there's a big pipeline and thank, that, thank you yeah thank you hi my name is Fredel. Mm -hmm. I know I've been able to speak before Miss Rodriguez and Mr. O'Farrell before I don't know if I've met anyone else but I'm happy to be here I checked the box for number five but if there was a box for having a heart connection with my representatives I would have checked that one uh, <laughs> I'm from council district 14 uh, I really appreciate the open-heartedness and the work that's coming through this committee. I feel like regardless of how people in the audience might feel in the moment, I think that really good work is being done and that ears are open and hearts are working. Um, I wanted to lift up something that Share Self Help has recently created. They submit a proposal to LA for the HEAP funding. They said they can house 500 people for $3 million at $5,800 per unit. So if there's anyone from Share Self Help in the room, they should raise their hand, but any of the private uh, contractors or the development or any of the city council members should connect with Share Self Help because they have something really innovative happening. And thank you, Fredel. And they should, con they should connect with the mayor's office. Thank Shared you. Self Help. Yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, Chris Roth. Mm -hmm. Council members, thank you for your time. My name is Chris Roth. I'm with the Democratic Socialists of America and uh, a concerned uh, local citizen here in CD14. Uh, the funding that we're talking about here is for permanent supportive housing. 
And the key part of that is the wraparound services that come with it that are necessary for the residents in that housing. It's absolutely critical that the folks who are running these facilities have experience with running supportive housing facilities, or at least have received sufficient training from an organization like LASA before they could be considered qualified to run anything that's going to be funded through Triple H. I want that to be very clear. In regard to the discussions about the innovative qualifier for this subset of Triple H funding that this particular council item is about, I'd strongly urge that the city not emphasize avant-garde exterior design that looks like anything other than regular apartments. I was at an event at a permanent supportive housing complex with Council President Herb Wesson last fall in support of Charter Amendment B, and the most remarkable thing about that facility how was, how, was how utterly unremarkable it was to anybody walking down the street. You, it blended in seamlessly. You don't get lines because it's supportive housing, not shelters that kick people out in the mornings. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. So that's the last, uh, that's all the comment on item one, as I understand it. I don't see any other uh, comments on the queue. So what we'll do is, uh, colleagues, this, uh, we want to hear more details on this proposal. So I'd like to continue this item just to get more clarification. The panel heard the comments that were made. Um, <clears throat> And we want to get more clarification on the, on the following. Um, the, the review panel, which was verbalized, and it's, it's, it's pretty clear, but we'll get that in writing, and it's makeup. Um, other revisions to ensure that there will not be any displacement. So let's uh, just articulate what you were explaining on that. Uh, the design guidelines uh, slash minimum standards that should be included uh, in the RFP. Uh, and then uh, my other one is just... Uh, Handwritten note that means nothing. So the, those, those three items, uh, I, sometimes I take too many notes as these things go on. And I'm, so but those are the, the three uh, that I would like to report back on uh, when we hear this item again. Yeah, that shall be the order without objection. Thank you so much. Uh, and we do have additional public comment uh, cards, general public comment cards. We have seven. It's one minute each, and so we'll go ahead and, and do that to uh, close this committee hearing. I'll uh, start with Hesha Brown, followed by Kath Rogers, followed by Linda Lee. And if you all are here, you can come right up. Linda gave me her time. Well, we, we can't switch, we can't hand over time, but I'm sure, yeah, it's okay. Uh, I'm sure you can be succinct and, and let us know how you feel. So, um, Hesha Brown not here. You said Kath Rogers not here. Linda Lee and Antoine, uh, Antonietta and Antonietta uh, Jimeno, who I believe spoke earlier, perhaps. No. no. Her oh, her daughter. Okay. So if you could step forward, Antonietta Jimeno, Jimeno, Yolanda Alaniz and Arlita, please step forward. All right. Hello. Okay, my name is Arlita. I was downsized from the Cultural Affairs Department about 10 years ago. Then my mother died. Then I lost my apartment due to an illegal eviction by Stephen R. Rose. He, the case was done with dirty hands, per my attorney, Louis Rafty from Skid Row. Now I have stage four metatastic bone cancer. If I die, thank you. My mother died waiting for affordable housing. I know that the city council, many of them are embedded with the developers. What is being practiced these days is in economic genocide. I live in East LA, East Hollywood area, where boxes are being put up. Single family homes are being torn down and boxes are being put up. I lived there for 44 years. I think what's happening is disgraceful, it's criminal, and I'm a senior citizen, and I'm going to leave Los Angeles if it goes on. The rents have to be frozen. Thank you. Freeze the rents. Yolanda Alanis with the Freedom Socialist Party. I just want to say I take on the record I'm against the racist and anti-Semitic statements that were made earlier. Thank you. On owning and building and running it, you could save yourself a lot of time and money if you just did it yourselves and got the experts who live uh, and serve the, com the community uh, to help you. Why give up prevailing wages? Because then you're going to 
add to the already homeless population. Workers need prevailing wages. You, you're going to get what you pay for. Cheap wages, you can have a cheap product. You should pay union wages and hire union workers. And um, they should hire people who have lived, experienced, and being unhoused to manage and provide services at the site. And forget the bonds. We're taxed to death. I own a home that I can barely keep. Don't tax us anymore. You're taxing us out of our homes, and we're going to end up on the streets. And quit cutting breaks for the developers. You don't cut, give us any breaks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And that, uh, that clears the desk, yes? Yeah. Um, all right. So that's all the items, and uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.